Last week we saw accepting the grace of Christ for salvation based on his shed blood for the remission of sins. He enlisted you in his eternal army forevermore. Ready to face Satan's array of evil. Seeking to take down the kingdom of God any way they possibly could. The, definitely trying to take down any who would follow in his footsteps. Now knowing that uh, he lost the war at the cross, Satan understands that. But he's still seeking victory even now. Now there's two ways that he might be seeking victory. In pride, he may think that he can reverse the judgment the sovereign God has laid down for him. Or, on the other side, maybe it's just hatred. Trying to take down as many as those who would follow God as he possibly can. Joining him in Lake of Fire forevermore. Tempting new recruits that come from his kingdom into the kingdom of lights with all the temptations that there are, showing God that no matter who, you, who follows you, they're still going to follow me. They still will follow, follow the flesh. Today we learn from the armor how to avoid those problems, how to make it so that we can be effective soldiers of Jesus Christ. We know we move to a new, unfamiliar kingdom. We realize our victory can only come by seeking to learn of Jesus Christ and let him work through us, giving us the victory, not having us have the victory on our own because we can't do it. It's a kingdom that's totally unfamiliar to us. So we seek and trust in his power, in his might. Accepting and trusting his ability to eternally forgive our sins. Eternally protecting us from Satan's hell. Trusting him to give us a spiritual victory today in this hell-bound, sinful, carnal world as we wait for his redemption. Seeing Satan's fearful array against us, uh, not having a spirit of fear, but uh, realizing the eternal King of Kings and Lord of Lords is on our side. And he's far more powerful than this prideful, pitiful potentate that thinks he actually runs this world. Remember that victory comes from the entire armor of God placed upon us. Anyone who's done any fighting knows that you have to use every piece. If you don't use every piece, you will fail. But we trust the armor of God, and it requires us to trust the God of that armor. We must learn to trust him according to his word. Because that is how we understand how that armor is placed upon us. We must also understand our eternal king is also the captain of our salvation, providing us the victory in the war of how to stand fast and produce his fruit, holding that line, teaching us, leading us, defending us by the armor and by his grace, the same grace that saved us, we will have his victory. Trusting him working through us for that victory. And he willingly shares his glory with us after that. Now, that's an amazing thing. He's willing to share that glory with us. We will see him as he is. We will uh, have the same bodies he has. Not the same glory by any stretch of the imagination. But he's making us have uh, the same glory as a joint heir of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is trust him and follow him. Today we see uh, what that armor is and how to prove it in battle. Remember, David would not wear the armor Saul gave him because he had not proved it. We need to prove the spiritual armor that we can use it effectively to have that victory. Let us see how to use that armor for his glory as we stand fast against the wilds of the devil. Uh, if you can, please stand and give honor to, uh, to his word as we read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 18. So, Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse 13, we read. Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt with the truth, and have it on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all uh, perseverance and supplication for all saints. Heavenly Father, we realize we are in a battle, a battle that we cannot win, a battle of flesh versus spirit. And we are flesh, Lord, but we have joined ourselves to your spirit. We want to serve you in your uh, kingdom of spirit. We wish to have your victory. And Lord, we need to learn your ways to place your armor upon us. For you have the way of victory. You know the wiles of the devil that we cannot defeat. But Lord, you have already defeated him at the cross. And you call us to come to join your church, to be lively stones upon your foundation by being faithful to you and your call 
the very gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And Lord, it is not our victory, it is your victory. But you use us and share your glory with us. Let us, Lord, have faith, knowing that you are the sovereign God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and all will bow to you at the end times. And let us bow to you now, Lord, and stand in the gap, stand in the line, and prove the armor that you give us. We ask you to be precious sons in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. Well, again, last week we saw that you had to put on the entire army, armor of God to be effective. Then, seeing the ray of uh, evil that Satan has organized against us, Paul now continues to emphasize that armor and starts giving us what exactly that armor is and how to use it. And then, learning that armor, proving that armor, placing that armor on us, above all, being able to stand. Paul is stressing a strong defense against a very offensive foe. Learning Christ's uh, defense of his soldiers to withstand Satan on the evil day before we can take his offensive weapons into Satan's realm. Next week we'll talk about the offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, wearing the feet shod uh, for the gospel of grace. But you have to understand how to defend that before you can go and attack. And today he's teaching us how to defend against the wiles of the devil. How to make it so we can have that victory and not fall in the battle and be able to stand for him. We need to have our armor to stand the evil day. Now, which day is evil? It says, the evil day. Well, in this fallen world, every day is evil. Ephesians 5, 16 reminds us to redeem the time for the days. All days are evil. But it's more evil each and every day as we see that day approaching. We come from a dark kingdom and now stand against that dark kingdom for the captain of uh, the spirit of light. Romans uh, 13, 12 reminds us, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we need to lay hold, stand fast, and hold the line against Satan. Learning to take his battle by his word against Satan's kingdom. Why? So we can call other enemies from his kingdom of darkness into our kingdom of light. That we may have a wall that much sturdier, that much stronger, that much higher. Wherever we, wherever we are placed, we must fight that good uh, fight. We must be able to stand in whatever part of the line he puts us. Whether proving your armor is brand new recruits, knowing his spiritual ways by a spiritual word and becoming proficient, whether advancing as skilled warriors, taking his word of light into Satan's very dark world, or whether warrior leaders called by and placed under Jesus Christ, placed to build a body under Christ to accomplish Christ's call. We are called to stand in the gap in his church to withstand the very gates of hell. Look at the paper. Look at Fox News today. Are the gates of hell trying to attack the church? It will prevail if we trust in his armor, if we do his word uh, by his will and take the battle to him from his word, trusting in him. If we let him work through us, the gates of hell have nothing on us at all. It's only if we give up that the gates of hell will prevail. But facing his temptations and clever carnal wiles, we see his armor made powerful through four things. First of all, truth, righteousness, readiness, and salvation. And each piece has a different type of armor to protect different parts of our carnal lives of the flesh that we may prevail in the spirit. So first of all, truth. This is the very first piece of armor. This piece of armor provides absolutely no protection. None at all. But without it, the rest of the armor is useless. The belt, girt with truth, is what we're talking about right now. What was the belt? I mean, we have all these other pieces of armor. But if the armor's just flapping around, you're going to die. The enemy's going to see the openings, and he's going, to, he's going to be able to use those to defeat you in battle. Paul informs us to be able to stand with the one who's girt with the belt of truth, and that belt holds the rest of the armor tight to the body, that Satan cannot uh, reach it. He provides no gaps to attack because you have trusted his spirit to protect your flesh. The truth giving us the ability to trust and prove the remaining armor, being able then to stand. His truth gracing our one offensive weapon, the sword of the Lord, at the side that it is ready at any time to be able to pull. And that offensive weapon, the sword, is also a defensive weapon. If someone comes at you with a sword, you want to be able to stop that sword. Well, you stop it with your sword, and you do so by his truth. Today, the world seeking truth to satisfy the flesh. Now, 
What's the God of this world right now? God of this world right now is science. Falsely so called, 1 Timothy 6 20. Uh, seeking, seeing false truth in 63 genders, in evolution versus creation, in so many other ways that it would take all day to go through all the ways of false science today. But that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to replace God with science that satisfies the flesh. Or how about your heart's wisdom? You know, Jiminy Cricket used to say, just follow your heart. Absolute worst advice ever given to anybody. Jeremiah 17, 9 calls the heart deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I know my heart is evil. I want my heart to, have, uh, to be able to be made righteous, which we'll talk about in a second, by his truth. And it's the only way it can be is if we yield to his truth. How about politics? People get together, we're all smart people. We'll get together, we'll pass laws that make it so that we have a righteous society that way. Well, the problem with that is, no, slavery at one time was legal. Right now, abortion is called a blessing in many churches. Why? Because the state is called legal. So, we can't trust any of these things. The only source of truth is right here. That's it. Amen. Everything else has to yield to it. And if it doesn't, we will fall. Now, the truth is, again, the world apart from Christ has no truth and no ability to hold on to his armor. That's why Satan wins so much. Because as, uh, anyone who tries to put on armor apart from God's armor will fail. Pilate asked uh, Jesus in John 18, 38, what is truth? He didn't realize he was looking right at it. He was staring at truth. John 1, 1 calling Jesus the word that was with God and was God at the very beginning. And as the word, uh, he then calls God to uh, prepare his kingdom's warriors, set aside for his service. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And that word will gird the rest of your armor to make it so that you can be effective. Because you can't be righteous without truth. You can't, uh, uh, you can't have shot with the gospel if you don't have the truth of the gospel. So to have his truth, we must study and learn his truth especially as new recruits. New recruits don't know anything. Now they have basic training. It's a miserable time, but they're learning how to act as a team. They're learning how to act with the uh, weapons given them. That's what, as a new recruit, that's what we need to do. We need to learn what the truth is to be an effective soldier, uh, proving uh, our armor by his truth. And it's not our armor. It's our armor given to each and every one of us. You know, when you were given, a, I mean, those of you in the military, when you were given your rifle, that was your rifle. But it's provided by the army. And then you were in charge of making sure that that rifle was clean, effective, and then you were efficient with it. Now, if you retired from the army, you had to give it back. So we never retire. We want that armor for our entire life. Well, we need to prove that armor. We need to have confidence in that armor. And we need to avoid error from believing Satan's clever lies by his truth. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14, uh, verse 14 for now. So I'm a new recruit. I'm coming into the spiritual kingdom. I'm learning as much as I can. Why? Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Satan is the chief liar. He knows how to deceive. He knows how to use a, a truth misplaced in a, way, uh, in a way that it actually becomes a lie. He's very good at it. Most of what Satan tells us is true. But he puts that spiritual lie in there, which makes it the most effective lie ever. And we fall for it. We need to have his full truth from here. We become effective soldiers by learning the truth, practicing the truth, ensuring the entire body holds firm with the truth, and proving his armor by his truth, able to trust all because he is truth. And we continue uh, right here in chapter 4, verses 15 to 16. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making an increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. Every one of you has been called, if you're saved, into his army. We talked about that last week. We know that. It's a war. It's a war we've already won, but the battles continue. And we still need to have uh, uh, victory in those battles. And we have to do it by being a body together. 
you know, uh, back in the uh, 1980s, I think they came up with this ridiculous uh, ad for the army, an army of one. You know what an army of one is? A lost army. We need to rely on each other, build each other up, teach each other his truth, that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. So, if we have that truth, we can learn how to be righteous. Without righteousness, we have no breastplate. That's the next piece of armor. And the righteousness is what protects our hearts from the sins that Satan wants to give us. So the breastplate protects the soldier's body from his neck all the way down to his thigh. Spiritually, again, it protects the heart. What's the heart? It's the core being of the natural man. The seed of emotions and how we act upon what we think intellectually is right and wrong. You no, know, right and wrong, sometimes we think it's black and white, it's not. There's always different things we've got to look at. There's different things we discuss. Uh, there's different things we have to figure out. And the heart determines how we want to operate that way. And, as we've already said, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? And you don't follow your heart. You follow righteousness. You follow truth. And that's what the breastplate comes in. Our problem is that Romans 3.23 says there is none righteous. No, not one. Well, you got a problem. The breastplate of righteousness is protecting my body. I'm not righteous. How can I put on that uh, breastplate? How can I make it so that I can be effective in his battle? How can I stand in the gap to make sure the very gates of hell, with the pitiful pope day, leading that array against the church, that I can do my part? That I can make sure I don't fall in battle? Well, knowing we're not righteous, only by faith in Christ can we then have his righteousness imputed to us. It is his righteousness that protects us, not ours. We need to trust it, yield to it, and rely on it. And turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 16 to 21, which lays that out pretty well. Romans 5, starting verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so was the gift. For the judgment was uh, by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men the condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men on the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness under eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So, as basics, we go and we prove our, we prove our armor. We learn righteousness by his word. We trust in his righteousness. We allow his righteousness to lay upon us, and then he is able to put that armor upon us. Without it, we cannot stand. Our life in Christ uh, is focused on his call on our life. As he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 4. No man ever wore entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And again, every one of you has been chosen to be a soldier in a different part of the battle, in a different part of the line, in a different way to provide victory. If you're aligning him with his imputed righteousness, your armor will be tight against your body. Your captain, Christ, will lead you and show you how to stand. Your heart will focus on his righteousness, and his righteousness will work through you, allowing you to have his victory and keep you safe from the wiles of the devil. Standing in his line, we must stay close to his leading. We're going to talk about communication a lot more next week in prayer. Right up, we're hitting just the armor today. But in Hebrews 10, 22, we read, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Notice the word says us. His body drawn together with full assurance for faith in his victory. We must all build each other up. We must all protect each other. We must all stand shoulder to shoulder against the wiles of the devil. Otherwise, the gates of hell will prevail because we have taken the church off his foundation. If you trust your own heart, you will not have his breastplate upon, upon you and your heart will be in nature. 
Once again, we read uh, Jeremiah 19.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We know that. You can't trust your own heart. You have to have his righteousness imputed by his word and yielding to it. Carnal hearts are no match for Satan's carnal attacks. Only by the, uh, relying on Christ can we be made righteous. Let us be holy as he is holy, relying on his holiness that we may protect our hearts from Satan's fiery darts, thrown as a roaring lion seeks to devour us. So with all that, we have uh, we have the uh, breastplate. We have it tied to our uh, tied to our uh, body on a belt. We need to be ready to get out and use it. So readiness is the next thing a soldier must be. Even a new recruit, a new recruit has to be ready because he's fighting against an enemy. If the enemy comes, he's got to be ready to, to defend. So we need to have our feet shod, and that protects our shins and our feet, able to run quickly even over un unfamiliar terrain. With feet properly shod, we're able to stand fast against Satan's array. Roman soldiers, when they look at the Roman soldiers' uh, feet, they had the metal on their shins to protect their shins. They had feet and they had spikes on the bottom of their feet. Why did they have spikes? So they could stand fast. If they pushed back, those spikes would help them hold. You know, an uneven terrain, suffering terrain, if you didn't have those spikes, they could push back. And that pushback might give them uh, a, a loss in a battle instead of victory. Christ allows us to rely on him and stand fast in his place as he puts forth his gospel to build his church. In doing so, we need to have those same kind of uh, feet shot with the gospel, to be able to stand fast against Satan's lies, to be able to hold forth his truth, give his truth that people may hear it and turn by it. The importance of standing fast on the word of God and his gospel in Jonathan Edwards, the text for his famous sermon, sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It was based on Deuteronomy 32, 35. To me, the law of vengeance and recompense, their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Properly shot feet, empowered by Christ's gospel, will not slide. You can stand firm because he uh, works through you, and he will allow you to stand fast. Let us stand fast, allowing Christ to drive Satan's attackers, sliding back into the slimy hell which they came out of making sure they will not attack this church, they cannot attack this church, and we'll have his victory. Now, even when seemingly not actively working with the gospel, we must be ready to have those feet shot, eating, sleeping, fellowshipping, working at jobs. We must ensure the gospel can be ready and our feet ready to run to the gospel anytime when we're called. Now, my dad was a fireman. Firemen spend a lot of time in the firehouse. They eat, they sleep. They, they uh, clean the house, they play cards, and anything like that, but when that alarm goes off, their, uh, their uh, boots are always right at the bed. That alarm goes off, those boots are put on, they put on all the things they need to defend themselves against the fire, and in less than two minutes, that truck is gone. That is the picture we need to have. We need to be that ready, if we have opportunity to give the gospel, to be able to drop everything and get that done, because that is the most important thing. But you say, I'm doing things that are so valuable. What's the value of one, of one soul in heaven for all eternity? That's the picture we need to have. We need to understand our job is for them to be ready to spread that gospel. So, to make all this work, first of all, if we don't have salvation, we don't have any of this, any of this armor. So we need to have that salvation, trust that salvation, and use that salvation to prove all the armor that is worthwhile doing. So, the last piece of armor comes from faith leading to salvation. We're saved by faith, led by faith, used with faith to have his victory by faith. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If I want to be an effective soldier, I need to know when the enemy is coming. I need to know how to defeat the enemy. I need to be able to learn how to defend myself, and I need to diligently seek him to have that victory. Faith brings you to the cross. Faith uh, accepts his shed blood for the remission of sins, leading to salvation. Former enemies of Christ uh, now uh, accepted for repenting at the cross of Christ who took their penalty. That is what faith does. He took my penalty. That is my penalty. I deserve that death. I'm not going to hell because I have faith in him. That's salvation. What do I do with that salvation? Well, I'm supposed to be used by him to spread the gospel because I am now a joint heir of Jesus Christ. He's the captain of my salvation. I'm supposed to follow in his path, do what he calls me to do. 
Leaving Satan's kingdom of sin, so I can be holy as God is holy, is what now I do. That, sh uh, that shield of faith uh, allows us to accept salvation and act on his callings in our life. Now, if we don't have a shield, we'll let Satan's lies uh, keep us from salvation. Some soldier came to Satan's carnal kingdom to bring you to Christ at one time. No. None of you were born saved. None of you were born righteous. Now, we read in Romans 3.23. There are none righteous. No, not one. Somebody came in to Satan's kingdom, delivered you the gospel. You then accepted that gospel, went to the cross, and let the blood of Christ cover you and let him save you. You think maybe we should do the same thing? We have a great gift. We need to give, make sure that others have an opportunity for that great gift. And Romans 1.16 tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and a salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here is a power behind that. No, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God that He has given to you to work in His gospel to bring people to Christ. There is no more important job than that. There is no more important calling than that. No, look at the look at the biggest uh, job we might have on earth. No, Genghis Khan. One of the greatest warriors of all time. Had the, huge, had the biggest, uh, biggest empire of all time. Where's he now? He's in some grave, probably burning in hell. I can't guarantee that, but uh, by his testimony, I would say he's burning in hell. When the fire, when the, uh, the earth is disappeared because of fire, because of judgment, no one's going to remember any of these things. But that one person you led to Christ will be with you for all eternity. That is the focus and the understanding we must have how important this gospel is. Now, the fiery darts and temptations of the flesh are trying to lead us to take off Christ's armor and fail in his line as we focus on this world and not his. Uh, 1 John 2.16 shows Satan's fiery darts of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, lead you to the pride of life instead of following him in service. His shield lies in the law of those fiery darts as we seek to fully understand our new kingdom. Act in sanctification and in holiness that we can show others what the kingdom of God is like that we can draw others to the kingdom of God. And you need to be different, a peculiar people, so they can see that difference and want to have that in their lives in this crazy world that we see out here now. And it shows us how to serve our captain. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing of exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I don't do that now. I'll be honest, I don't. Quite frankly, none of you do. But the whole idea is we need to practice. We need to do more. We need to make sure that we are working to do exactly that. To cast out every imagination. To put Christ first in everything we do. That's how you go from new recruit to the general eventually. As you learn how to put uh, your old life behind and accept the new life. Getting closer and closer and more effective as you move along. He puts on the last piece of armor, proving it all. The helmet. Of salvation that protects the head. And the head is the seat of intellect. Our head determines how we react by beliefs directing the body. The brain is what directs the body. It's what's making my hand move right now. What makes me sing so well, right, Joe? <laughs> Our head determines how we react uh, in the spirit by faith and humility or in carnality by pride and sensuality. It's the head that directs that. It's the head that understands that, and the head has to accept the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will follow him. Allowing him to give us the mind of Christ that we then yield to and accept and follow. Now, if you're in a battle, I'm not going to go to hell. I don't need it. It's heavy. You're going to die. Someone's going to hit you in the head and you're going to die. Refuse the helmet of salvation in spiritual battles. You are a false soldier who will face the second death that's mentioned in Revelation 21.8. Having your part in the lake of fire, which burned with the fire and brimstone for all eternity. That is the importance of the helmet of salvation. And it protects your head and allows you to withstand those fiery darts, learning how to use the rest of the armor effectively for him. A proper soldier uh, fights for a cause that's greater than himself. The captain of salvation is also the king of kings, the lord of lords, sovereign over all that we see and cannot see in the spirit. There is no greater cause. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whoever uh, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. 
Everything I own is for his use. Everything I own is for his glory. Everything I own is for his victory. As a new recruit, you must learn to use all the armor you have. Taking the helmet of salvation in faith, proving your armor, standing fast as you learn how to advance. Satan will probe your armor, seeking victory. That's what, that's what we do in battle. We seek to find weaknesses in the enemy. Satan will do that. He's good at finding them. With your armor and the one offensive weapon to repel Satan with your armor, strengthened by Christ, you will stand. Christ shows us how. Turn back to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Chapter 4, starting verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. I always love the, under, the understatement that the Bible uses. <laughs> and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a, the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, notice Satan does use scripture, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Satan left Jesus because by his word he will do, uh, because by his word he proved Satan's lies and proved that his armor was stronger than Satan's wiles. And he will do the same for us if we allow him to put that armor on us, to give us the wisdom, to give us the confidence, to give him the power by yielding to him and allowing our head protected by his helmet of salvation to yield to the mind of Christ. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, what will happen? And he will flee from you. Satan loved Jesus because Jesus used the word. You use the word, he will flee from you. Huh? Why did he fall? He had his back from the word. If we stay true to his word, he cannot win. Because we have trusted in Christ, put our faith in Christ, and allowed Christ to direct our path. So as we look at it, to closing it all down, we start a life of disciple of Christ as a soldier, learning to defend against the wiles of the devil in that evil day. And again, on earth, all days are evil. We realize we have no ability to obtain spiritual victory in our own carnality. We must learn his way of victory, take his helmet of salvation, and protect our minds from the damnable heresies that Satan puts uh, in front of us each and every day. Focusing on his word by his spirit. Proving his armor that we can obtain his victory. Now we think of successful soldiers as mighty physical warriors, relying on strength, bravery, and cunning to win. You know, the idea of a, a soldier, someone that can bench press 300 pounds, has a mighty man, you know, it's kind of like a life, right? But if you rely on these, you will lose in a spiritual battle. We rely on carnal, humble, uh, we rely on carnal, humble weaknesses to let the strength of Christ work through us for his glory, as Paul did when he prayed for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. The 2 Corinthians 12, 9 shows how he accepted the fact that Christ did not want to do that for him, and he had a better way. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my grace is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's the power of Christ will give you victory, not your own. You use the strengths he gave you, but you let them yield to Jesus Christ. So we wear his armor, reflecting the meekness of Christ, proving his armor. Meekness in an equal day does not mean weakness. It is not the same thing. It is using the strengths, whatever strength uh, given you by Christ, under the yoke of Christ, led by Christ in love to produce fruit for Christ, 
in the holiness of Christ. In Philippians 4.13, I can do, that next word, it's a difficult word that uh, the King James always puts in there, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. From the mouth of a Christian babe, a little Christian girl was once asked if Satan ever tempted her to do wrong things and how she kept from doing them. The answer was, yes, I know he wants to get me, but when Satan knocks at the door of my heart, I just say, Jesus, won't you go get the door? And when Satan sees Jesus, he runs away every time. <laughs> the strongest man alive is not, uh, uh, is not strong enough to meet Satan alone. But by the power of Jesus Christ, that little girl can defeat Satan because she had faith and let him do it. We only receive his armor by faith in the shed blood of Christ for the remission of sins. Taking the belt of truth from his word to tie all the armor together to repel all of Satan's fiery darts. With breastplate of righteousness to pick the heart, with the shoes ready to the gospel of Christ, faithfully taking the shield to withstand those fiery darts, and yielding fully to Christ by placing the helmet of salvation upon your head to give yourself fully to the mind of Christ. Next week, we'll see the critical nature of prayer again and his word by the sword of the Spirit to obtain offensive spiritual victories. Not just standing fast, but actually going to take terrain from Satan. And terrain is by, uh, by uh, hearts that will then come to the cross and be repentant. That's what he uses us for. I save nobody, but he uses me and every one of you to bring forth his truth that people may then yield. But today we lay the defensive foundation of the Christian warrior. Rely on Christ, you will fight a good warfare. As we get ready to go out into battle, as we get ready to go out and defend the church against the very gates of hell, we need to pray. First of all, thanking God that he has enlisted us. Thanking God that he has called us into his kingdom. Thanking God that by his shed blood, our sins are forgiven and we will not, never face hell. We have no fear of that at all. And we have no fear of Satan because he is not our king. The greater he is in us than is in the world. But we need to prove that by his word. We need to prove that trusting him, yielding to him, and letting him work through us. Do that, and you will have his victory. Your victory will not look like what the world thinks victory is. No. We are killed all day long. It makes us more than conquerors. Not a way of winning most battles uh, to talk to you at the Air Military Academies. But he will use you in a mighty and glorious way to bring forth his victory. And then you will meet him and hear that well done, good faithful servant. So first of all, as we go to prayer, thank God for the salvation you so freely gives. And then, thank God for how he's used you. Then ask him, where will you place me in this battle? I know you've called me, Lord. Where will you place me? I want you to do so. Show me by your word how I can be effective. And show me how to yield incorrectly when I'm wrong, that I can be effective, because I want to please you. And I'll close this prayer, and then we'll say what we need to do to be effective. That's to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that in your love you sent your Son to reveal God the man, to walk among a man giving a perfect testimony, to allow man to put you on the cross, that by putting him on the cross your blood may be shed. And by your shed blood, our sins can be forgiven. If by faith we accept that blood as the penalty for our sins, and uh, then bow to you forevermore. And Lord, doing so we know that we are in a spiritual battle, a spiritual war, a war between good and evil, a war that's one Lord, but Satan still seeks victories in every battle. And you prepare us for those victories, Lord, by giving us your armor. Lord, first of all, we give you all praise, honor, and glory, and thanks for salvation so freely given. We give you thanks for the fact that you use us to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ's chief cornerstone as lively stones to build the walls against hell that hell will not prevail against it. Lord, help us to use that armor. Put that armor on effectively each and every day. Allow those shoes to be right by our beds if we're sleeping and on at every time that uh, your word may go out and obtain your victory. And Lord, use us in a great and mighty way. Help us, Lord, to understand your way. Help us to understand your spirit. 
We are unable to do it on our own, Lord, but by you uh, working through us, we can do all things. And we'll give you all praise, honor, and glory for it. Help us, Lord, to learn how to build this church. Help us, Lord, to build each other up. Help us, Lord, to allow each one of us to have your victory. Lord, this is a body. It's not each individual person, it's a body. Allow this body to be molded together in joy, producing your victory, that we may know that you are among us. And we ask all this in your precious son's dear name. Amen. Amen. And if you please turn to 326 and we'll sing. Uh, turn it on as Jesus. Do stand with me as we prepare to sing hymn 326, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Protect the church, have his victory, and we'll see you next week. You are dismissed.